with all the brand new Apple Silicon Macs, I figured it would be a good balance. Actually, look back at when Apple didn't use x86 architectures before. This was back in the PowerPC days. This is the very last and the fastest available Apple iBook. Going back in history to 1998, the introduction of the G3 clamshell iBook launched a new product line for Apple. This succeeded the uh, older PowerBook lineup with a more consumer-friendly design. Uh, and of course, the G3 iBook especially was very, very consumer-friendly uh, and colorful, like the iMacs. After that, they introduced the Snow White design, which this also uh, mimics, sort of. And uh, that continued on until 2005. And uh, this is the very last of the iBook lineup before they introduced the Intel MacBooks. So let's uh, take a little bit of a wider shot and take a look at all of these uh, family members uh, side by side. All right, here we can see from left to right a 12-inch iBook G4, a 14-inch iBook G4, and the Intel MacBook that replaced them. The way Apple really uh, changed between the 12 and the 14-inch iBooks in terms of specs is basically by bumping up uh, some specs here and there. The main thing was CPU clock speed. On the left here we have a late 2004 iBook G4 that clocks in at 1.2 GHz. The equivalent 14-inch model to that had a 1.33 GHz CPU. If we were to uh, extrapolate that to the 2005 models, the 14-inch has 1.42 GHz G4, the 12-inch would have had 1.33 GHz. You see a little bit of a pattern there, right? That's because the front side bus of the 12-inch was always clocked slightly lower than the 14-inch in order to achieve some uh, very artificial differences indeed. Overall, internally, the machines are very much the same. They have the same ATA bus, they have the same graphics chipsets, they have the same screen resolution, and more or less the same keyboard, aside from the ribbon cable length, which is, again, an artificial difference. But that's basically how they differentiate between 12-inch and 14-inch. Of course, after this, they went to widescreen with the Intel MacBooks. They have a 13-inch screen resolution. And uh, yeah, there was no other consumer-grade MacBook from that point forward. So let's take a look at the overall footprint of the machines. Again, this is a 14-inch. This is the 12-inch, so you can see what the difference in size really means. They're not terribly different. Like I said, they share the same screen resolution, but the iBook G3, or G4 rather, 12-inch uh, is just a little bit smaller overall. All right, let's get that out of the way. Let's open up the lid on the 14-inch iBook G4 right here. And you can get a glimpse at its overall condition. You can see here is a little bit smudgy in the light, but uh, I can assure you it's in a decent condition. Just needs a little bit more of a clean here. The cleaning product I used left some residue. We'll get that sorted. Also needs a, a new keyboard, but they're remarkably hard to find for the 14-inch. <laughs> I've actually bought one, and it turned out not to be a 14-inch, but a 12-inch keyboard. So the length of the keyboard cable was not long enough. So we're stuck with this one for now. All of the keys work. That's just fine. And again, these uh, marks you see here, they uh, will come off uh, just uh, some residue from the cleaning product. It's a little bit greasy, I guess. Screen resolution on this 14 inch display is 1024 by 768. We'll boot it up just uh, to get that going. The battery still works on this. And while it is booting up, we can take a look at the side profile. In terms of ports, we have a modem, 100 megabit Ethernet, Firewire 400, two USB 2.0 ports, mini VGA, and a headphone jack. Uh, that optical drive is connected, but there's a problem with the IDE ribbon cable, so it won't actually uh, read discs 
Uh, it will read them, but it won't communicate with the operating system. So unfortunately, uh, <laughs> no optical drive on this boy. That's uh, a bit of an annoyance, but not a deal breaker. These things are a hell to get inside, and uh, got a little bit of story about that. Uh, all right then, story time it is. Um, yeah, so lots of these uh, iBook T4s use very slow hard drives. Just as an example, there's like a two and a half inch hard drive. Uh, I don't have any IDE ones on hand at the moment, but uh, yeah, they're quite slow. And what I usually do is I open up these machines. I put an SSD in it with a special converter. So I can use M2 SATA or M SATA uh, SSDs and uh, put them in machines like this. I turn into uh, my other power books and iBooks that uh, that we have here, and uh, they all run very well. Now this iBook was a bit of a pain in the ass. There is a reason you're seeing a logic board here, and that's because while I had to take it apart, at the moment uh, you in the guides that you have to remove um, a power connector, so you can get the top case off, uh, yeah, you can probably see this little glued area here. I asked my father-in-law to try and resolder the uh, header that went onto the motherboard because it sheared right off, even without putting any force on it. And uh, he gave it a good try, for which I'm very thankful, of course. Uh, then I tried to keep it into place by putting a little bit of glue under there so it would uh, stay put. In the end, this did not fix the issue. So, um, yeah, it still wouldn't turn on after I reassembled the system. So I had to buy a new logic board. <laughs> That's what's in there now. So, yeah, after I got the new logic board in, I could swap out the SSD. And uh, everything went uh, together fine. Because these machines are not sought after at all, the parts are still reasonably cheap. I bought a motherboard from the US. It was about $23, and then that doubled up to get... Uh, shipped and taxed across but uh yeah this is one of those things you have to live with um it's also a good time as any to uh take a look at what the logic board for these machines looks like so this is an entire ibook g4 fortune Inns logic board so let's, let's take a look around right here we have some soldered on ram on the 2004 and uh yeah actually the 2004 models they have 256 megabytes of memory here. The 2005 models have 512 megabytes soldered onto the motherboard. One DDR sodium slot. This will take DDR 2100 through uh, 2700. And that should work fine. You can upgrade it to a maximum of 1.5 gigabytes. So you can add a one gigabyte sodium here. This is the IDE ribbon connector. This is where the keyboard connector goes. Some auxiliary connectors here. This is where the battery connector uh, is usually installed. This is the CMOS battery that keeps the clock going. Of course, this one is empty, as they all are by now. Here is the IDE connector for the hard drive. It is a ZIF connector. You have a special converter that you click onto the drive, and then just drop it in here, and uh, the friction will keep it put, as well as a slight uh, plastic little cover here that will put some pressure on it that should uh, keep it in place nicely. Here we can also see the previous board serial number and that it is a 1.42 gigahertz part. Here we have the graphics processor for the iBook T4. The 2005 models use the Radeon 9550 mobility or the other way around, mobility Radeon 9550. It has 32 megabytes in the configuration that Apple uses. Nobody knows why, but they chose to uh, use 32 megabytes. It's a decent upgrade over the uh, 9200 mobile that the older models use. And this one supports Core Image and Quartz Extreme, whereas the 9200 only supports Quartz Extreme, but no Core Image. What this means in effect is that uh, if you install Leopard on it, you'll have a translucent menu bar or you will not have one. Uh, that's the way to see if you have core image or not. But anyway, here we have an Ajir chipset of some sorts, uh, and up here is the Motorola PowerPC CPU. This is a uh, 1.33, or actually wrong, 1.42 gigahertz CPU. It has a 142 megahertz uh, front side bus. So yeah, they'll have 10x multipliers. The lower models use lower clocked uh, multiplier, or a uh, 
frontside buses. Right. So that's basically the most important bits on this logic board. There's not much to see on the back except for all of the chips. Again, here's more memory chips for the onboard 512 meg. They're uh, distributed along uh, among eight chips there. Nothing else on the back here of interest again. And a port layout obviously is just like we described on the system itself. All right, and here we have our machine. So one of the good things that the 2005 iBooks brought in terms of upgrade is the fact that you now get a scrolling trackpad with two finger scrolling. All the older models don't have any scrolling at all. So it's good to see. Let's see if we can load the Apple website here. It's obviously going to take a little while because these machines are not known for being very quick uh, at this point. Here we go, we have an ad for the iPhone 14. And we can two finger scroll through this website, which is very neat. And it does it reasonably well, considering the age of the machine. If you go to about this Mac, cause this app. Uh, you can see we're running macOS 10.5.9. Now, that version technically doesn't exist because it's uh, Sorbet Leopard. I restored it to the SSD to make sure that it works. We have 1.42 GHz PowerPC CPU, 1.5 GB of RAM, so we max it out. Here we can see some other information. It's a PowerBook 6.7. I mentioned the front side bus speed. Here we can see it's running 142 megahertz. The 1.33 gigahertz version of this, so the late 2004 would have a 133 megahertz bus. We just have an Intenso device here, which is the SSD. This was the cheapest 120 gigabyte SSD that I could buy new from Amazon. This is an M2 SATA SSD, so not M2 NVMe because it obviously wouldn't work. And it's converted to IDE using a cheap uh, 15 buck converter that I got from uh, Amazon again. We have Firewire on board. Here we have the Mobility Radio 9550. And the memory that we have installed is actually uh, yeah, a very slow PC2100U, which is I think DDR200 or 266, something around along that lines, along those lines. I'm not entirely sure at the moment, but uh, it's the only one I had, and I'm not, uh, I can't be bothered to buy a new memory if uh, I can reuse the ones that I already have. Our battery is still working fine. We don't have any serial ATA, this is just regular parallel ATA. I also have Bluetooth, USB 2.0, and Airport Extreme 54 megabit wireless which is very nice. Battery seems to hold up just fine. Estimates a runtime of about three hours, which is decent for an original Apple battery from 2005. And uh, overall, the system appears to function just fine. An SSD does not make as much of a difference as you would think on a system that still has parallel ATA because it, the bus speed of that is definitely keeping it, uh, holding it back, because it's only limited technically to 100 megabytes per second. And you do get some of that SSD excess time uh, benefit, but overall, it's, it's not a speed demon. But it's definitely a lot more usable with this than the included Apple 4200 RPM drives. Especially once you have a bit of an optimized OS like this Sorbet Leopard is. You can get it online uh, for free, obviously. Um, and that SSD, you could just see that even something very sluggish like Office 2008 for Mac opens up in just a couple of seconds. Which is honestly decent because it's one of those programs that just seems to always take forever to launch. Which is the reason why I usually install Office 2004 if I have the need for any Office applications at all. We also have iWork on here, iWork 09. The very last version that will work on PowerPC. There 
there we have the famous gradient keynote template which was always used by Steve Jobs on stage that also works fine everything, everything just takes a couple of seconds to load but overall for light tasks it's, it's, it's honestly not a bad system if you start uh, running very heavy websites like apple.com or even god forbid the enemy number one for power pc which is youtube you just see that it takes a while to load it eventually gets there uh, don't expect to watch any youtube videos on power pc using a browser you're better off using something like 10.5 tube or a software like that as long as they keep working and google doesn't shut them down because that happens sometimes when I change their API and the old clients just stop working. But yeah, here you can see that uh, YouTube is definitely a bridge too far. It's trying, but we're just getting beach balls all across the board. <laughs> yeah, we've sort of killed it now. But our CPU was pegged at 100%. I just uh, force quit it because it was just not going to work. Now you might wonder why. Why am I making a video about an iBook? It's just one of those box standard Apple laptops from like 17 years ago. What's the big deal? Well, I've always liked iBooks. It's one of the first things that I made a video about once I started picking up a camera on this channel uh, all those years ago. So I will always have a sweet spot for them. And uh, I like to share that uh, that experience with other people and uh, yeah I just wanted to share this uh, little new acquisition uh, with all of you guys I hope you enjoyed this video I thank you all for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one